Welcome and thank you for joining today's California ISO Board of Governors meeting. Before we begin, please ensure you've opened the WebEx participant and chat panels by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. Please note that all audio connections are muted at this time. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the host. With that, I'll turn the conference over to Roger Colanton. Please go ahead. Thank you, and good afternoon, board. Good afternoon, everybody. Let me start out before I turn it over to our chair with roll call. Um, chair Galitova. Present. Vice Chair Bogwad. Present. Governor Bornstein. Present. And Governor Leslie. Present. Thank you. Turn to you, uh, Chair Galitova. Thank you so much, Roger. Welcome, everybody. And before we start our meeting, I wanted to ask if there's any public comments on items not related to the agenda today. Um, with that, let me just interject that at the last board meeting, Eric Eisenman at PG&E had um, attempted to make some policy, uh, comments on the policy roadmap and uh, was not able to do so. He did later send some written comments for the board, and those comments have been presented to the board as well as to management. Great. Thank you so much, Roger. Any other public comment at this time? Uh, if you would like to make a public comment, you can enter the comment queue by pressing pound two on your telephone keypad. You'll hear a notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, please then state your name, affiliation, and comment. Once again, if you do have a comment, please press pound two to enter the comment queue. Okay, no comments like, at this time? It yeah. looks like we have no comments at this time. <laughs> okay, great. Moving on to item number two, decision on general session minutes from our December 16th meeting. Roger? Yes, um, yeah, sorry. I think I did the cardinal on mute then. Uh, <laughs> I hate a motion. Motion to approve the general session minutes from December 16th, 2020. So we have a motion. Yes, Mary moved and second. Severin second. Severin is second. <laughs> and, uh, Lots of enthusiasm for this item. Okay. Well, it, 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 is, it doesn't really get much more exciting than this. No. Any, uh, <laughs> Wait. Roger, this is Otto. Did you have a question? The, oh, the, yes. Um, the agenda says it's December 16, but the minutes seem to say it's December 17. Um, that's a good question. And let's see, typically we use the date when the board meeting started, but let me ask, I don't know, Stacey Carpenter, if you have those dates in, in hand. I believe the general session was on the 17th. So let me, um, let me, yeah, let me correct the motion. They are the general session minutes from December 17th, 2020. So let's use that date and we can revise them as appropriate. So then the motion and the second is yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Ash, I appreciate that. And um, so let me, let me go ahead and, and take the vote. Um, Governor Bogwa? Aye. Governor Bornstein? Governor Bornstein, you vote on the minute? Aye. Can you not hear me? I, no. I could not the first time. Sorry about okay. that. And uh, Governor Galitova? Aye. And Governor Leslie? Aye. Great. Thank you, board. Thank you. Item number three, CEO report. Yes, thank you, Chair Galitza and Governors. This is Elliot Mainzers uh, with my CEO report. Uh, thanks for the time. I wanted just to start out by saying, of course, this has been an exceptionally uh, busy start to, to 2021 with a lot going multiple different fronts under continued total work from home restrictions. So thanks to everybody for all their work. And I know it's, this is a, a tough operating environment. I have a lot to cover here, so I'll try to work through it as expeditiously as possible. I want to give you a brief update on the ISO's coronavirus response, uh, talk about the final root cause analysis, uh, summer 2021 readiness where there's a lot of activity, our recent bond refinancing, 
uh, the new nodal pricing model with Pacific Core, a uh, topic you'll hear about later t this afternoon around the Morongo tribe becoming a participating transmission owner, and a new settlement timeline that we developed in response to a lot of customer feedback. So starting out with the coronavirus response, we remain in a highly restricted building access posture and expect to remain in that status for the foreseeable future. We continue to work actively with the governor's office, the Calvary Health Authority, to try to receive priority vaccinations for our mission critical employees. And we are exploring other channels to secure vaccinations for our broader workforce consistent with the state's prioritization criteria. So at this point, a vaccine is proceed, vaccination is proceeding uh, relatively slowly, uh, but we continue to try to keep our folks right uh, in the queue. With respect to the final root cause analysis, on January 13th, uh, the CTC, CDC, and the ISO released the final version of the root cause analysis of the events of last August and September. The report largely reiterated the key findings of the preliminary root cause analysis in October but we were able to augment the final report with some additional data on resource performance that we didn't have access to back in October. The report confirms that the three major factors contributing to the August outages were related to extreme weather conditions, resource adequacy and planning processes, and market practices at the ISO. As noted in the report, the climate change-induced extreme heat wave that spread across the Western United States last summer resulted in demand for electricity exceeding existing electricity resource adequacy and planning targets. Additional work is needed to ensure that sufficient resources are available to serve load during the net peak period and other periods of system stress. In addition, a subset of energy market practices obscured the tight physical supply conditions, which included under-scheduling of demand in the day at market and convergence bidding. A scheduling priority enhancement that had been implemented several years previously inadvertently caused the ISO's day ahead residual unit commitment process to fail to detect and respond to the obscuring effects of under scheduling and convergence bidding during August stressed operating conditions. The ISO is now actively developing solutions to these market design issues, but it should be noted that most of the day ahead supply challenges encountered were addressed in the real time market as a result of additional market imports, energy imbalance, market transfers, and other emergency processes, purchases. We've provided additional data on a number of fronts, including an analysis of the performance of demand response resources. This raised some eyebrows in the demand response community, and I wanted to emphasize that we remain very focused and committed to evaluating whether there are elements of our market or policy framework which may have contributed to observed demand response performance issues and we're working closely with the demand response service providers to look for ways to enable such resources to play an important role in helping to maintain reliability in California while proceeding with rigorous analytical methodologies for net qualifying capacity. The final analysis not only provides a comprehensive look at the causes of the rotating outages on August 14th and 15th and assesses how resources perform during these periods, but importantly, it sets forth important recommendations and actions that are being addressed by the ISO, the CPC, and the CDC. And we look forward to working closely and coordinating with the state agencies and our industry partners to avoid rotating outages this upcoming summer. We're gonna to continue to engage with and seek input from stakeholders to further refine our understanding of the key issues that contributed to the events of last summer, including relationships between temperatures and loads, planned outage management, and necessary changes to the planning reserve margin for our market footprint. Finally, I wanted to reiterate the Department of Market Monitoring conducted their own independent analysis prior to the publishing of our final analysis, and they agreed with many of the key findings and recommendations of the preliminary root cause analysis and found no evidence that market results on these days were the result of market manipulation. I want to state it again, we, at the ISO, we are absolutely committed to the integrity of the market and will always be on the lookout for untoward behavior. Summer 20, with respect to summer 2021 readiness, uh, we all, I think, state agencies at the ISO have a strong sense of urgency and are engaged on a number of fronts to prepare for summer 2021. And a summary of our key initiatives and activities can be found on our, on our summer 2021 preparedness website, a uh, page on our website. Just to highlight a few of our primary, primary focus areas, though, we start with a commitment to make any necessary changes to our market processes to address the lessons learned in the root cause analysis. We also have efforts underway to work with the battery storage industry to ensure that the battery fleet is fully charged for duty during the net peak under stressed operating conditions 
while also endeavoring to help the battery storage providers optimize the commercial value of, this, of their resources. This is an important evolutionary conversation. I think we'll have key elements in place for this summer, and we look forward to ongoing dialogue with the battery storage industry to best align market practices and the reliability needs of the grid. We're also refining our proposed increase in the planning reserve margin, establishing additional mechanisms to ensure rational price formation <clears throat> during stressed operating conditions, and planning for implementation of our system market power mitigation proposal in August 2021, subject to board approval. Over the course of the spring, we're going to be working with the CPC, the CEC, the governor's office, utilities, community choice aggregators, generators, demand response and distributed energy resource service providers, EIM entities, and adjacent transmission operators to ensure that the power system is as healthy and well-coordinated as possible going into summer 2021. We're also scheduling a set of tabletop exercises to stress test our planning activities in early summer. We're doing everything in our power to preserve reliability in summer 2021, but remain concerned that the state continues to face operational risk, particularly with respect to the ability to secure firm imports from adjacent regions. We're going to continue to engage with the CPC, the IOUs, and other stakeholders to make sure that we have clear and workable rules and policies for securing firm imports into California for this summer and beyond. I want to touch for a moment on, a, on our very successful recent bond refinancing. Uh, thanks to the phenomenal efforts of our CFO, Ryan Segazio, and his team from Finance and Legal, the ISO's bond refinancing in mid-January was, was tremendously successful. The bonds were very well received by the taxable market, which submitted $2.5 billion in orders for $175 million in bonds. And this oversubscription status across the bond deal was indication that investors placed tremendous value on the ISO's credit. Uh, final pricing was tightened uh, 15 to 20 basis points across all maturities to reduce demand, and refinancing will result in nearly 1.8 million in annual savings and over 26 million in net present value savings over the life of the bonds. And the unsecured and taxable structure of the bonds will also relieve the ISO of several administrative burdens. So this was just a tremendous outcome, and thanks again to the to the team in finance and legal. I also wanted to to share with you that on January 14th, uh, the ISO implemented an innovative day-ahead advisory nodal pricing model for Pacificor. Uh, Pacificor intends to use the nodal prices produced by the contracted service to calculate the net power costs for each of the six states under its service territory. The ISO's day-ahead net nodal pricing model service le it leverages the ISO's existing day-ahead market technology platform, the ISO's full network model, and data interfaces similar to the energy imbalance market as the foundation to provide the nodal pricing model solution. This technology solution will automatically inherit any new features and day ahead market design enhancements in any future initiative. And by providing greater visibility into Pacific Wars day ahead and real time system operations will support regional reliability. This is I think a very, just a tremendous example of the innovation of our technology team and partnerships with Pacific Core, and of course, it comes on this week. We're also very pleased to see uh, the, the announcement by El Paso Electric of their intention to join the energy imbalance market in 2023, and of course, another very strong quarter of EIM benefits in Q4 2020. So tremendous momentum and innovation on that front. This next item is a is a very very I think very important and and the milestone development, and the board will be asked later this afternoon to approve the ISO's acceptance of the application of Morongo Transmission LLC for participating transmission owner status. This will be the first federally recognized American Indian tribe to become a participating transmission owner. The Morongo Transmission LLC will become a PTO with respect to its interest in the West of Beavers upgrade project. This interest was established by a transaction between Southern California Edison Company and the Morongo Tribe, allowing Edison to construct the project across lands within the boundaries of the Morongo Indian Reservation in exchange for the right for the Morongo Tribe to participate with SCE in the financing of the project. I'd like to thank both SCE and the Morongo Tribe for their creativity and flexibility in developing a win-win situation, enabling this critical transmission project to proceed in this new innovative business relationship. And I'd also like to thank SCE for their diligence and perseverance in bringing this key project to completion. Finally, I'd just like to mention that the ISO began executing a new settlement timeline 
beginning with trade date January 1, 2021. And this, this outcome is the result of a great collaboration with market participants on policy rules, implementation details, and testing through a joint market simulation. The, the new timeline extends the publishing of the first settlement statement from three to nine business days after each trade date, reduces the total number of settlements statements from nine to seven, and reduces the overall settlement time horizon from three to two years. The new approach reduces the time obligation for market participants to consume, process, validate, and store statements, and it was developed to address feedback from ISO balancing authority and energy imbalance market participants, and is widely supported by the market participant community. We really appreciate the feedback and collaboration that got us to this point. The last thing I'll mention here, when I turn it back to you, Chair Galitava, is there is a tremendous amount of work underway in policy development with our stakeholders across our footprint and, and outside in adjacent areas of the West. Uh, we are working very hard and will continue to do so to make sure that we communicate very effectively the implications and strategic intent and interrelationships of these various policy initiatives and look forward to continuing to integrate the feedback of stakeholders on the many different elements of these procedures and policies to make sure not only do we have a best position for summer 2021, but that we're establishing rules and parameters for our markets that, that both protect consumers and also ensure rational price formation and successful resource integration. So thank you very much. Appreciate the time for the update. Of course, thank you very much. And this was very, very useful. And congratulations to you and the team on the successes. And on another first, the Morongo Transmission LLC, very, very heartwarming to see this new collaborative effort having access to participating in the footprint. I also wanted to draw attention specifically again to the final root cause analysis and point out the hard work that the CPU, CCC, and KISO puts forth together. And the effort that we have made as the ISO, as we always do, to be incredibly transparent about our analysis post the heat wave event. We'll, of course, continue to work with all of our stakeholders and specifically with PUC and CEC on the recommendation and the action items that we need to take. And that we're also very, very committed, as always, to working through our very successful stakeholder process to process everything quickly and have prioritized efforts that we need to focus on for this summer, especially because we could not have the same problems that plagued us last summer come to the forefront again. So I really wanted to acknowledge the hard work and the collaboration and the team effort and look forward to a successful summer readiness uh, situation where we are ready to face anything that comes our way. So thank you again. My pleasure. Thank you. And I appreciate uh, your support and continued commitment to transparency. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, the EIM is very, very important for all of us. And I always am excited and look forward to the report from the EIM Governing Body Chair, John Prescott. Actually, before we move on to that, could I ask a question about the CEO report? Sure. Um, actually, this is perhaps for Ryan Segazio, who doesn't get enough screen time, um, and so I hope he's on. Um, this was this was a fabulous outcome uh, on the bonds. It sounds like uh, we will save even more money than we thought. I was curious about how the pricing change occurs and whether 15 to 20 basis points is what took the demand from 2.5 billion all the way down to 175 million. Or if um, essentially this is like a initial public offering that some of that got dissipated with the, um, uh, the brokering. Ryan, are you on the line with us? If he's not. Um, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I thought he was. It's okay, but I can tell you that he used exactly that language with me in describing it, that, that it was that basis point move that was necessary to basically adjust the demand curve for the bonds to get to equilibrium. So that's what we got to. And, and you're right, we also uh, were able to exceed expectations in terms of total yeah. savings. So spot on. Okay. Well, Thank congratulations. you. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes, 
congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, do we have John Prescott on the line? Hey, operator, Hello. can you go ahead and send that command? I think Just I heard John. you. Can you hear me now? Okay. John, you're on. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Good afternoon, Chair Galitifo and Governors. I am speaking today on behalf of the Western EIM Governing Body. The Governing Body met virtually on January 20th of 2021, and in our executive session, Governor Bornstein gave us a report on the DMM Oversight Committee, and Eric Hildebrandt and his staff gave us a briefing on DMM activities. And in our general session, Therese Hampton, Chair of the Governance Review Committee, updated the Governing Body about the Governance Review Committee progress, and I believe Therese will give you an update right after my report today. Then we heard from Oregon PUC Commissioner Letha Tawney, who is the chair of the body of state regulators, and she updated us on their activities. And then Pam Sporborg with Portland General Electric, chair of the Regional Issues Forum, gave us a report on their current activities. The governing body then discussed the process to evaluate the performance the Western EIM during the summer of 2020 events and our responsibilities under our charter. We understand the EIM performed well and provided value during the summer of 2020 heat wave. However, there still appears to be some op opportunity for improvement. The governing body desires that all stakeholder concerns and improvement suggestions are heard and evaluated, and we hope that the market learns from the events of last summer to make the EIM more resilient and more useful during such events. The governing body reiterated its commitment to transparent processes to develop market enhancements that are fair and equitable to all market participants in accordance with our charter. While making it clear that we are not suggesting additional or new stakeholder initiatives outside of the current initiative, the governing body had several suggestions for staff to assure the completeness of the market enhancements for summer 2021 readiness initiative as it relates to the EIM. Our suggestions included a detailed analysis of current EIM resource efficiency rules for all participants, gaining a better understanding of the events of September 6th, improved onboard training for new EIM participants, and further analysis of demand side resources during such events. And then finally, during our general session, we heard a report from Greg Cook on the policy initiatives roadmap and annual plan. And just a, a note here, you heard that El Paso Electric has committed to join the Western EIM in 2023. We're excited about that. And uh, I also, I, I'm not sure if Elliot gave you the number, but our uh, Q4 of 2020 benefits exceeded $68 million. So we're at $1.18 billion in gross benefits. So that's it's a sign of success. Uh, so with that, that is the end of my report. Thank you very much. Yes, the EIM has been very successful, and we are very appreciative of all the hard work that the EIM governing body has put into ensuring that success. And thank you again for the offer of all hands on deck for summer readiness, anything the EIM can do to help out and for 2021 is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item number five, um, as Chair Prescott pointed out, EIM Governance Review Committee Chair Therese Hampton will give us an update on the Governance Review Committee activities. Thank you, Therese. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thanks for the opportunity to give an update. Just a reminder of kind of where we're at in the process. Uh, we issued a revised draft proposal on December 14th and held a general session on December 18th and kind of went over the major elements of the proposal uh, for stakeholders. And today is the close of comment on that revised draft proposal. So uh, we are looking forward to those comments. We extended the comment uh, period by about a week and a half just out of uh, because we did have requests for re uh, extension but also recognition of a lot of work that's going on in the very important 2021 summer readiness initiative. Um, so we will review those comments. The GRC has an executive session scheduled for next week um, to really 
kind of look at those comments and figure out what our next steps might be. Um, as we've said before, the comments are really important to the GRC. It's part of what uh, helps us determine kind of uh, where to go next. And so we want to take some time with those and we'll figure out kind of where to go after that and report out, I think, both to the public and then uh, back at one of the future board meetings and let you know where we think um, our next steps are and what the timeline is. I have said before, um, I think I've said for a year <laughs> that we hope we would hope to have a final proposal to you by Q1 of 2021. I don't think we're going to hit Q1 of 2021, but, um, but we'll kind of come back to you and uh, give you a sense of where we think we're at and what our next steps are going to be. And I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions for Therese from the board? Thank you so much, Therese. Uh, uniformly today, people have been commenting on how well the GRC committee has been run and very and acknowledging your great work and running a very effective process. And we look forward to the next steps. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next item, decision on participating transmission owner applications, Neil Millar. Oh, hello. Uh, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, Chair Galipova, Governors, uh, this is Neil Miller. First, I would like to uh, just add a few comments and then I'll turn this over to Mr. Riddy Ray, who will walk through the presentation and, and the decision item. I did want to add my thanks to Elliot's, to both Southern California Edison and the Morongo Tribe for their efforts in enabling this project to move forward. The project increases the power transfer capability of the West of Devers uh, transmission facilities by approximately 3,200 megawatts, providing deliverability for renewable generation locating in the Riverside East and Imperial Valley areas as part of meeting California's renewable goals. So it's a very important project to us. Uh, Edison filed this application with the CPUC back in 2013. It's been just over five years since a few of us were testifying as to the need for the project, and it's now expected to be completed by May 15. So we're very pleased to see this project coming to fruition. So I just wanted to offer those comments up front, and now I'll turn it over to Mr. Ray to walk through the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Governor Galetova uh, and Chair Galetova and Governors, uh, yeah, I, I will proceed with walking everyone through the uh, presentation. And a lot of it is, is going to, I'm going to be going off uh, the comments that Neil made. Uh, Christina, if you could move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, as uh, Neil mentioned before, Morongo Transmission LLC, uh, they have an agreement with uh, SCE, which allows them to lease a portion of the transfer capability under the uh, West of Devers upgrade project. Uh, as part of that arrangement, Morongo has gone ahead and filed the transmission owner tariff and the transmission revenue requirement, which is currently uh, pending for FERC approval. We do expect it to be approved uh, sometime in February, and uh, we are preparing internally in you know, to be able to onboard and implement them as uh, upcoming participating transmission owner. Uh, the West of Davis project, it, uh, it does cover 48 corridor miles and 184 circuit miles of 220 kV transmission line. Uh, it is of critical importance to the ISO. It's bringing on hundreds of uh, megawatts of uh, renew new renewable generation, which uh, is of great benefit to us in the state of California. Uh, Christina, could move to the next slide. Uh, this is a snapshot of the uh, layout of the project. Uh, the, the agreement between SCE and Morongo has allowed SCE to access eight miles of uh, right of way along this transmission corridor, uh, and in return, Morongo is receiving 61% of the transfer capability on this line. Uh, Christina, if you could move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, I'll go, I'll provide a quick overview of the application process. The, the process that Morongo has gone through, it is the standard process which we have applied to our uh, other new participating transmission owners. Uh, they have, they had submitted an application in 2020. It was posted for public comment uh, and 
for next steps. We are looking for the uh, the Board of Governors to authorize the acceptance of uh, the application. We will also proceed with uh, executing the transmission control agreement. Uh, we are going to wait on the FERC approval for the transmission owner tariff and the transmission levy requirements. And once the uh, operational control of the facilities have been transferred over to the ISO, the uh, Morongo transmission will become a participating transmission owner with us. Uh, Christina, if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, as we reiterated before, this project has been of critical importance to us. Uh, we have had uh, no public comments, and no one has opposed our application. The current transmission participating transmission owners have also not raised any objections or concerns with Morongo Transmission LLC becoming a party, party to the transmission control agreement. Uh, and that concludes the presentation. Thank you very much. Any questions from the board? Yeah, this is Severin. I'm just trying to make sure I understand what uh, we're approving here. So Mar Morongo Transmission LLC wants to become a PTO. Um, and I guess as I read through this, I was unclear on why that's the organization rather than SEE, which is already a PTO, operating the line and Morongo being, the Morongo tribe being compensated for that. Um, is there something more planned that goes with this and that's why they want to be an owner, uh, an operator of the line? It's Neil here. Uh, this is the same type of arrangement that uh, Citizens Energy entered into, uh, where their preference was to, in effect, lease and have an entitlement to a, a, a portion of the capacity of the facility, and then bring that facility into, I put it under, ISIL operational control. So th this has been a more common investment opportunity that we've seen uh, sorry, uh, a more common investment opportunity that we've seen in a few other cases, and it was their their preference for how to develop this arrangement. Uh, Rudy, would you have more to add to that? Uh, no, this is the only thing I would uh, just highlight is that SE will continue to operate and maintain the line. Morongo is simply going to be a financial party uh, in this arrangement. It's, it's good to open opportunities like that to entities that haven't traditionally been part of this process. And just like Citizens Energy, I think this is a welcome addition to the transmission owners and participants. So this is, this is good. Thank you for doing it. Do we have any public comments as well? Once again, if you would like to give a public comment, please press pound two to enter the comment queue. And we do have a few in the queue at this time. Wonderful. First caller, please go ahead. Please identify yourself and the affiliation you're with, if you could. Caller, please make sure your device is not set to mute. All right, then we'll go ahead and move on to our next caller. <laughs> Caller, please go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Tom Shireen. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, we, yes, yes, we, we hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, chair uh, Galipova, this is Tom Shireen. I'm the vice chair of Morongo Transmission. Um, uh, members of the board of governors, uh, Kaiso management and staff, um, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, and I'm here today to, to urge your approval of Morongo Transmission as a new California ISO participating transmission owner. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an important day for the Morongo Band of Mission Indians, and indeed uh, for Indian tribes everywhere. Carl Zichella, when he was Director of Western Transmission Policy for the Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, described this deal between the Morongo Band Morongo Transmission and Southern California Edison 
as a landmark in tribal utility cooperation. And, and while it is, um, eminent domain is not available in Indian country, and the history of uh, tribal utility interaction has all too often not been a happy one for the tribes. Uh, for example, the most the Morongo Band received in any year during the prior 50 years of the original right-of-way for the West of Devers uh, transmission line was $31. Um, that the band and Edison were able to reach a ratepayer neutral solution that avoided the added costs and delay of having to go around the reservation is, is really a testament to all involved and proof that it's possible for tribes and utilities to find creative win-win solutions uh, to seemingly intractable problems. Uh, Morongo Transmission will hold a leasehold interest in the project for 30 years. Uh, Southern California Edison will have a 50-year right-of-way for the transmission upgrade uh, that will help it uh, deliver renewable energy to California. Morongo Transmission's investment uh, will cost the ratepayers no more and actually slightly less than if Southern California Edison had fully funded the West of Devers upgrade. Uh, the Morongo Band of Mission Indians is, own, is the majority owner is the Morongo <coughs> Band of Mission Indians. Uh, the minority owner is Coachella Partner, uh, which is owned by Axiom, Axiom Investment, excuse me, Axiom Infrastructure. As management's board member notes, in becoming a participating transmission owner, Morongo Transmission will turn its leasehold interest over to the California ISO operational control. This model was first used by Citizens Energy for its participation in the Sunrise PowerLink project and has worked out very well. Um, Morongo Transmission is awaiting FERC approval of its TO tariff and transmission revenue requirement has or will fulfill all tariff requirements for becoming a PTO and is ready to execute the TCA. On, on behalf of uh, Morongo Transmission <clears throat> and the Morongo Band of Mission Indians, I'd like to express uh, our appreciation to the many people who have made this possible. Uh, Southern California Edison has not only been a wonderful partner, uh, but has managed to bring the project in significantly under budget and well ahead of schedule. Uh, we're grateful for the support and attention of the commissioners and staff of the CPUC, and we want to express our appreciation for the collaboration and interest shown by LADWP, the Department of Water Resources, Six Cities, Tank, and the City of Santa Clara. We want to thank the members of your staff for their help and guidance throughout this process and in particular for their testimony before the CPUC. Morongo Transmission urges you your <clears throat> support of the motion to accept our PTO application and to make first, the first filing what? necessary. I'm sorry, and to Is make the first filing necessary I to didn't obtain know, I didn't approval realize that. Of, the, of the transmission control agreement. I'm, I'm very happy to answer any questions you may have uh, this concludes my remarks. Thank you so much, and thank you for all the hard work and for bringing this land, landmark tribal utility cooperation agreement on time and under budget. I mean, for a transmission project, this is really tremendously successful. Um, any other questions? I'm just very excited about this. More comments? Do we have other comments? Okay, if there are no additional public comments. I thought we had one more. Yeah, I thought the operator had said that. Uh, it looks like we have no further comments at this time. Okay, so if there are no comments from the board or questions, shall we move to the motion? Certainly. Thank you. Move that the Move that the ISO Board of Governors approve the ISO's acceptance of the application of Morongo Transmission LLC for participating transmission owner status, conditioned on one, Morongo Transmission execute, 
executing the transmission control agreement, and two, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission accepting a transmission owner tariff and tra transmission revenue requirement for Morongo Transmission. That's set forth in the memorandum dated January 27, 2021. So moved. Oh, so moved. Angelina got her on to a second. And let me go ahead and take roll um, for the vote. Governor Bogwat? Aye. Governor Borenstein? Aye. Governor Leslie? Aye. And Governor Glitzer? Aye. Excellent. Thank you, Governor. The motion passes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, item number seven, we have some informational reports. Are there any questions on the informational reports or anything that we need to discuss at this time? Hearing none, we will adjourn until tomorrow for executive session. 8 a.m. Excellent. Thank you, Governors. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.